Hi, everybody. Good evening. I am Alex Gartenfeld. I am the Artistic Director at the ICA Miami, and uh, it is a pleasure to welcome you to ICA Speaks and our conversation tonight with Stephanie Heinze. Um, this conversation is a culmination of a longer dialogue between the institution and Stephanie. We are really proud that we are the first museum to have acquired a work by Stephanie's. Um, it's hanging up uh, in the museum's lobby um, currently. So if you haven't had a ch chance to check it out, you'll see it on screen. It's entitled A Hollow Place in a Solo Body from 2020. And we're delighted as champions of artists of all stripes to be supporters of Stephanie's incredible practice. Um, this piece, which we'll talk about, is a radically unique world unto itself, um, a painting that draws upon automatic drawing and other themes in order to bring to life such fantastic characters as pale-eyed birds and a wet eggplant set amidst a sublime and complex composition. So a lot for us to talk about. For those of you who don't know, ICA Speaks is a series we have at the museum that we host every month or so spotlighting artists from our permanent collection. Since our founding, ICA Miami has been one of the most active collecting organizations in the country and in the world, supporting um, emerging and established artists. And of course, because you've all been to our venue, you know that we can't show our collection all the time. So ICA Speaks is an incredible way for us to bring our collection out of storage into the world and share it all, with all of you, with all of you in person and uh, on our video screens. That said, we will be doing a presentation, our first major presentation of the museum's collection in May. It opens on May 12th. It is a co-curated by myself, Jean Moreno, Stephanie Seidel, and Amanda Morgan, who are sitting here uh, and joining us tonight. Um, it will feature a wide range of artists, a significant number based in Miami, a significant number based beyond, uh, including Rashid Johnson, Christina Quarles, um, Henry Taylor, MacArthur Binion, Stephanie Heinze, and many others. To me, as somebody who's been working with our curators to build this collection over the last number of years, it'll be a really wonderful survey and a chance to see not just what we're collecting, but how contemporary artists are dealing with the most pressing issues of our time. So I myself am actually quite curious and interested to see this show. So that said, um, Stephanie here is in dialogue with me tonight. It's an exciting moment to hear her speak. She has prepared some visuals, um, which date primarily back over the last three to five years, an incredible time of transformation in her studio and her practice. And I'm excited not only that we're presenting her first museum acquisition, but also her first museum talk. Um, this comes off of her fresh from her first time in Miami and a week of enjoying uh, Miami's great weather. So thanks all for being here. I'm going to provide some quick bio before our Q&A. Um, Stephanie Heinze um, studied at the National Academy of Fine Arts in Oslo and the Academy of Fine Arts in Leipzig and has also participated in the residency, at, residency program at Skowhegan. Her work is included in public collections across the world, not just in Miami, including Mamco Geneva, uh, the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, the Hepworth Wakefield, and Fadaciano Sandretto Ray Rebadango in Torino. Now, that's a lot uh, to take in, but um, I hope first, before we go into any questions, you can all join me in a warm welcome for Stephanie Heinze. So before getting into this, if we could go to the next slide, I think actually Stephanie is both our, our star and our MC. Oh, are, we, are we going to the slides? Are we? Hi. Let's do it simultaneously. I thought that as you share with us the first drawing, um, you could, we could start, and I actually hate this, so I'm going against my better judgment, but if you could start with a little bit of biography, being as mm. this is your first talk here, um, mm. I guess, what I, one thing that would be interesting for us is just for you to walk us through your development, um, becoming an artist um, from childhood <laughs> all the way to um, being a student. If you don't yeah. mind sharing with us what that kind of moment was of becoming an artist. Yeah. Um, hello. 
First of all, hi Alex, thanks for having me. Um, it's wonderful to be here to see all of you. Um, it's funny to sit here with a very old drawing from 2014, I guess, um, when I was still studying in Leipzig and I was about to graduate. Um, yeah, but I mean, what happened before that? I mean, I, I come, I'm, I'm 34 years old. Um, I'm born in, in the east of Berlin. Um, so in GDR times, I would say like quite East German family. Um, I would also say I'm not, I didn't grow up with art. Um, and, uh, I guess I just always been fascinated by drawing and, um, creating things in a little world. And it was always a possibility for me to zone out from the real world. And I guess maybe for you it is as well as if you go to a museum and you want to see certain things. Um, so, um, yeah, so drawing was always a thing for me. And I think the, the way I started drawing was just like seeing my, my father when he was still around. I was probably really young, like four or five years old, and he was painting an Easter egg. And I was like, oh, I want to do that too. So this is how I started engaging with it. And I was always doing it. And I didn't even know that being an artist is a kind of job. I still doubt that. But, you know, I keep myself motivated and um, inspired. And I think drawing is a very nice way to, to do that because it's really small scale and you can take a book or anything to any place and it's intimate and it's like safe. Um, it's kind of like, yeah, probably writing a diary, but more of like a more funny way of language and it, I've it, it resonated with me in a way that I could feel like I can express myself the, the way I can and I can have humor in that and whatever and I can be something um, so yeah when I studied or when I started studying I was quite young I was 20 and I was like, I, I want to do that. And I, I never know uh, if that's going to work out for me or whatever that would be. But so I kind of ended up in Leipzig because it was just two hours from Berlin. I had no idea of the Leipzig School of Art. I had no idea of art. I don't know if I have it now, but <laughs> I like it. Um, yeah. And so I ended up in this figurate school of painting, figur figurative school of painting, very traditional uh, in a way of making an image. And um, I never really felt like being like a purely figurative painter. Um, I don't have any images before 2014. This is from my graduation from 2014. I did a lot of other things as well because I got, I'd never knew what to do in painting, to be honest. I was like, there's so much that has been done. Like, what is my task in there? So I kind of just like did a lot of weird things until at some point I was like, I'm just going to enjoy color. And I love color. So, and here, this one you can see is quite like free form. Uh, it's large, like, I think in centimeters, so this is like 360 height, 450, what is that in, you don't know, it's huge. 450, so it's like 17, or 15 feet. Okay. Across. Okay. So basically what I thought for my graduation, because I was quite lost in that school for a long time, and people were like, "What? who's that crazy little girl? And I was like, who are these crazy people around me like, <laughs> who are so obsessed with figurative, phallic painting? Um, so I was like, I'm just going to make a large painting, and this is like six panels, so each of them could fit the door and fit my hands so I could take them down when they were wet, you know, because paint is running. Um, and um, this is what I did, and I, you know, I, I was just painting on it. And then at some point I had this, like, I wasn't really satisfied with it. And there was, like, a moment that came into my work that I was doing this drawing, 
because my one of my teachers was like, if you don't know what to do, you need to draw. And I like the idea of like, if I go the traditional way of painting, like I do a sketch and then, you know, I turn a sketch into a painting and th that became kind of a thing. And that drawing, you can see it here, that was like A3 and I was holding the drawing, you know, against, like I was like stepping away I was holding the drawing against the canvas and was like, oh, this is nice. So actually what you see there is like this piece of paper. I didn't project or anything. That's why it epically failed. And I, I called it Ain't Sent Nobody. And um, this is actually like the first piece, I would say, that like I used a drawing to turn it into a painting. And that became a thing. I wanted to set the scene a little bit um, because you're covering a lot of really rich territory. Um, I think probably just because there's a geographical dislocation, you referenced the Leipzig School, um, mm. which uh, f art historically tends to represent something quite male, uh, quite machismo. Um, Neo Rauch is probably the best known practitioner, not to attribute any kind of negative connotations to his work in specific, specifically, but it has a lot to do with um, great myths, narrative, large-scale painting. Um, and you take on some of that material in your work and definitely don't take on others. I was just to kind of in terms of a, posing a prosaic question, maybe you could talk a little bit about landing there in Leipzig. Um, you mentioned not being fully immersed in that history before you got there. But what was your kind of visceral response when you became immersed in, say, the Leipzig School? And I'm mm. sure studying with some of the luminaries of that school as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I was 21 and I was really you know, I was really motivated to express myself, whatever that meant during the time. It was, there was some certain kind of expressiveness and energy that I had that now I'm like, oh. <laughs> but, and then, you know, for the first two years, we had to do um, all these life studies. They were like, you know, they really put, um, they really put, uh, put on the brakes and were like, no, you're not allowed to do that. And there was barely time to do my own work. So like in the two years, we were just like in the zoo, drawing and, you know, having life models, drawing cubes, um, watercolors, but not in a fun way. It was mostly like black and white today. No, <laughs> no color and just linear drawing, just that, you know. I went home crying a lot because I was like, you know, I felt like this is the moment of my life and now I'm going to have fun. I didn't. So it helped me a lot, though. Like now I feel like I, I you know, it was good that I had all this direction to to understand how the basics work. And but what I what I kind of didn't like about the school and I come back to the to the patriarchal part of the school, but um what I didn't like about a lot of painting there was like, they were like very good figurative painters, very crafty, like very subtle in some ways, some of them. Um, but what I didn't like about it was that it was just shown craft in the front. Or like when, you know, the, the very famous ones with the myths. I think a lot of the paintings are actually quite fun, but they're not meant to be fun. I think they're meant to be really serious and really charged and really loaded. And I think I'm like more of a person that goes from the other way. Like I don't like to charge things so much. And I think things are charged in themselves already which is actually also something that I teach us, they taught us. They say like, okay, we're all painting an apple and we're so individual, so the apple would always look different. So I guess, I guess it had an impact on me, but I was entirely bored by it, for sure. Like, you just look at a bunch of apples, you know? But I love apples, so no offense. And the fruits are still in my painting, so it's also a thing. Um, but you know, there, there must have been other ways. And I like to throw things, throw things around and like, you know, break the rules. And then the teacher would come and be like, this, this, no, you can't, cannot do this. And I was like, okay. Uh. 
<laughs> yeah, and like for me, yeah, growing up with, or like not growing up, but like being taught in that school, um, also actually not having any attention there was actually, I, I have to say now, the best thing that, you know, could have happened to me, that Nero left the class and I went to follow up class. I didn't like my professor so much. Like he was, um, yeah, in, in some different kind of painting, <laughs> interested in that. Anyways, but for me, just I, I did my own thing and I, I kind of just, yeah, tried out things and failed again and again and again. And just like at some point ended up doing this and also had this, yeah, I, I tried to do something that felt like impossible and that, that felt like, I, yeah, that is also removed from me in a way, like to where I can kind of feel more loose because things have always felt really tight, like how you have to do a painting, like how you have to present the painting. And like, I was like, I don't know, like why do I paint a figurative painting with like a few figures in there and one wears like blue pants and the other one wears, you know, it, it's just so funny. Like, how do you decide that? And like, it's so valid, all these questions and like, you know, when you look at paintings and we, we talked about this one painting that is here and we're like, what, why is it, why is the eggplant there? Why is the butt there? Let's, now we jump to all the paintings and we go to the painting. And I love that. I love that people think like, why? And I'm like, I'm not the one who's telling you what to see. I'm just like presenting forms that are somewhere this Heart. is the painting in the museum's collection, by the way. That's the painting that is to be seen in the ICA. So, depiction of things, depiction of color, the difference between drawings and color, and what happens when you turn a linear drawing into a painting. That is something that I became kind of obsessed with. And before, everything was quite messy. I was tinkering, I had a lot of shit in my studio, I'm trying to do installation, like in every kind of art student probably in Germany. I don't know how it is here, but um, yeah. So I kind of just like, it was like tidying up my room, my space, and like, okay, I'm gonna do drawing, I'm gonna do painting, and when I draw, I jump in it and I see what happens. Now, one of the things I think people love about your paintings, and I'll use this particular painting as an example, is they're really hard to describe. So, and you just described a little bit of your thinking on that, which is, yeah. you know, this idea of challenging the conventions of painting. But I think perhaps what's easiest, at least for me, I don't want to speak for other viewers of your paintings, um, what the easiest way to de describe your paintings as, if I could pick from any tradition, is sort of surrealism. Because one, you're inspired by automatic drawing, which has a surrealist kind of track record. Second, because this painting has a kind of metaphysical landscape. And three, because you're, or four, whichever, um, because you're combining sort of disparate objects mm -hmm. in ways that are evocative. Um, we mm. connect them because of our interest in psychoanalysis, for mm. instance. Mm. I'm gonna simplify that observation and just say, um, where in your work, particularly coming from, say, the tradition and place that you did, how did you kind of encounter surrealism? And do you even think of this as a kind of way of thinking through your work? Or is that mm. a total sort of wrong hat to put on the paintings? I think I understand why people say that and do that. And I can see, I can see links for sure. Um, I mean, I think I'm, I'm more in, like, I, I'm not so much about the isms anyways. Like, I, like, there is a dreamlike thing to them. But also because there's a lot of like characters or like faces with closed eyes. And I think it's more about like an inward going 
like feeling space that is going on. But of course, when I draw, it's not about that. The automatic drawing, I don't know if it's tied up to surrealism. I have no idea, to be honest. Um, it's just, I think when I think of surrealism, I think of dreamscapes and like stuff, yeah, that you could dream, but my dreams don't look like that. I mean, I don't know about you, but would be a bit intense. <laughs> And it's also, I mean, dreams are moving images and there is some kind of fluidity in there, but then it's not, I mean, things are dripping, but in the end, it's a surface, like it's on top, nothing is moving in there. So it's more like, how can I draw something? And when there's no color, how can I draw something that is in between? And of course, there are things that are quite banal that you can, you know, this reminds me of an eggplant, this reminds me of um, a bird... And there's also things that come back from my past, like we had a little bird like that and it got a tumor, and, you know, and we, we were fighting a lot at home. And I, I remember at some point that this bird was like in the cage and like was falling down, you know, and it was quite dramatic. And like, so was probably my childhood. But, you know, now it is like, it was kind of like someone I could relate to as, you know, like an alley or something and who like appears again and I was drawing the bird also as a child so I'm confusing a lot of things here but um yeah I I just like to like imagine that you know the bird is still here has different shades there's a little bit of Rapunzel over there wears a little bit of makeup and I think that's beautiful that you can do that you know and, and I don't it's more of like of an offer of new language, new imagery, new way of seeing color. And I think that's also, that is like a way to describe painting between abstraction and figuration. I mean, these are the things that I know, abstraction, don't know what is there, it's color and form, and then there's figuration, but where's, you know, where's the line? I mean, is that an important tension for you that the work pursue these two themes? Um, I mean, I think it may perhaps an interesting way of thinking about that question is I'll just choose because in front of us, there's this kind of um, butt, for lack of a better word, sort of legs sort of thrust out away from us. We can't see them. It's in a let's let's say it's a sort of, I don't know, disempowered position. Um, this abstraction of the figure yeah. seems like it's a very, it's a recurring symbol in your work. Mm -hmm. um, you never give us kind of the full figure. There is always a, an abstraction of that figure. And it would seem at least from our, some of our previous conversations in how you describe them uh, is that it has a little bit to do with power. Yeah. That the figures oh. are empowered or disempowered. And there's a question even in this um, particular tableau of this kind of, of which of the birds, you know, what state they're in, what power this kind of Rapunzel-like figure has. Could you speak a little bit to that? And I don't want to be overly simplistic in terms of thinking about like gender norms, but you know, I think maybe that is an axis through which to, which to read at least some of the imagery. Um. I think about connotation. I think about how we how we think about colors and uh in a way that they represent certain things and and I think I think uh that influences languages, life, um moods. Um I had a thought, but I lost it just now because there was a lot of <laughs> there was a lot of things uh, happening here. But um, what was it in particular that you wanted to ask me? So the in, power. In, well, yeah, in power some structure. questions, in some of our conversations about mm. about the figure, you've talked about them as submissive or non-submissive, which is a word that's very specific and has struck me, um, mm -hmm. and so that does make me think about you know, maybe power is a way of bringing these images into the real. Mm. I, I think what I thought, yeah, now I have it again. Um, uh, I think 
when I, when I look at a lot of paintings, I I see like a lot of like moral ways in which they're put, um, or I think of paintings as like a, a narcissistic representation of people and how they how they would like present themselves to also you know be it's it's a very very weird like. Yeah, I, I just wonder, like, what what is this? Like, what is the reason why you have to put a painting out there to, like, you know, take up space? And like, what do I want to do with that? And sometimes in like storytelling or like figurative paintings, you have this way of like, oh, this is the narrative, or it's illustrating certain things. And an abstract painting, sometimes it just like. We pro probably talk about Gustin a bit because I wrote my thesis about Gustin. <laughs> he was saying something like, "If you paint stripes, it's just stripes." Like, and I agree. So, <laughs> so like for me, it doesn't tell me things. So, I just yeah, I think it's pretty interesting to see like what someone wants to tell you or like how paintings are made, if they're like splashy or expressive or if they're tender and there's always like a certain direction and I think I I never knew how, like in which direction I want to go because I felt like I have all these feelings and they change throughout time so while I'm doing that painting, you know, it, it goes through all these stages And then at some point it becomes dense and some of them are like this one is, I think, very subtle and or these in general are. This is from last year Frail Juice show in, in New York with Petzl. Um, does that say? Well, it's funny. So, I mean, it probably doesn't <laughs> strike the audience this way, but your mind actually went the exact direction I was sort of thinking, which cool. was connecting um, this word morality which you use which is a very specific one yeah. to your interest in Philip Guston and also in the cultural interest in Philip Guston and knowing that you had written on Guston in your studies mm. um, I this is a vast simplification of Guston's practice but I would say that figuration is a moral decision in the development of that work it's a way of talking about um, the role of the artist in society. Mm. And I wonder if any of that spoke to you as you were thinking about, you know, as you think about developing your practice and in as much as the figure appears, sometimes with eyes in some of these paintings which you scroll past in a kind mm. of perhaps oblique reference to Rus Gustin, but also through Antonio. use of cartoon. Um, yeah. To what extent have you internalized Gustin as this kind of call to a cartoon of the real or something? Yeah. I guess the way of like animated drawing kind of uh, ends up there. But I mean, the initial motivation for me to draw or when I was like, what do I want to draw? And like, I'm in this like school where everyone wants perfection from me, like perfected, figurative, whatever. So I, I like the idea of like drawing drawing a circle and then I'm not good enough so it becomes an egg or some funny shape and I put a little thing in the in the middle and then it's an eyeball or a butthole, you know. It's like, and I became really fascinated with that and that's kind of the, the first step I would say like here, you know, and then there was this, I mean, here I didn't translate all of it, like that became a thing after, but I like the idea of like when you transfer the drawing into painting and you, you know, you cross things through, you scribble and then you kind of translate it exactly the way it is, but it's still, and then it actually just becomes a painting if I really translate the little details and I like that it becomes like, Yeah, kind of like putting makeup on or something when you work through the details or like it, it has this like really way of old ambition painting, but at the same time it's not, you know, and doesn't look like that, like doesn't reference that. 
I want to remark on something really obvious, which is okay. the painting you showed us from your graduate show, which I think you think of as a, or have described as a turning point in your work, it's really big. Um, and uh, for a student, I mean, I think it's an extremely ambitious way of, of um, expressing yourself. It also introduces just technically this kind of multi-canvas technique that you've been using to create big paintings without having to get really big stretchers. And the painting that we have is also a 2D painting. Now coming again, and I don't want to like harp on too much because I think it's a little silly, but what was the drive to make these, um, these kind of really large scale paintings uh, and the importance of doing so like in this place in your career? I guess I found it funny. Like funny ironic <laughs> or funny like... Uh... I mean, I, I, think, I think I wanted some attention <laughs> to be honest. Um, and that I found funny. So it's like, you know, it's, it's like this kind of, okay, no one has ever been interested in me. Now I'm making this painting. I have to do a graduation. But it was also just an idea to, to like see what happens if I do that. And of course, and I showed it and they were like, oh, she just wants attention. I was like, no, this is not true. Now I think like maybe it was true, but <laughs> it's also not a bad thing, you know, because it is about that. It is about that. It is about wanting attention and wanting to say something, wanting to be like, hey, I, I just, did a really weird circle there. I mean, now it became something else, but the, the circle actually is there, you know, and the bubbles and this kind of stuff. And I like that. And, um, and then at some point it became, I would even say political. And, and I, I like to put like plateau, platform shoes in there, little toes and the trunk situation with the elephant and, um, and the painting was called Ain't Sent Nobody. I mean, or A Stephanie Nobody, <laughs> if you would say. Um, because since I'm a child, I was like putting my name on things and it was always ST dot. And I had no idea that it was to say it that way, but that's like the connotation for me. Um, but yeah, I, I like this. This idea of like, I'm a quite small person, but like, I actually feel very clumsy and I like often feel unsafe. And like, the way of expressing that and doing that and jumping into that and showing like, this, this is how it is. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling sometimes like my body is, you know, I'm, I, I don't have full control over it. <laughs> Stephanie has a lot of great quotes, which Thanks. I prepared, one of which, and I won't even ask this as a question, but one of which is, I like clumsiness as a tool, which I think you <laughs> sort of just explained. But yeah. instead of going over that, I wanted to actually, you're talking just about, it strikes me how personal some of the process is. And I thought you could show us the drawing that you made in Japan, which you were explaining to me which is this kind of crying figure um, and has a kind of expression, very kind of expressionist aspect to it as an image, although it may appear rather abstract. Could you like sort of set the scene for us in terms of creating this image and sort of like, you know, what it means to its time and place? Yeah. Um, I think it was the first time I went on holidays and I, I don't know. I mean, I went to the States before, but I also didn't travel much before uh, I, I showed paintings in the world. So um, so I went on, on holidays in Japan and I sat in, in, in a temple and it was quite beautiful just sitting there. And I like to draw in, in places that are not the studio. I collage them in the studio, but I um, like to draw like on the plane or um, in this case it was outside um and i think that was also a moment when these like closed eyes figures came into it like really inward going and it was quite an insecure time for me as well um even though it was very secure in the moment and i guess this is when it became a bit emo <laughs> and um 
Yeah, and I, I, I do use like these banal forms, like an oven glove, like a really simplistic hand. Um, and I put a face on it, I made it crying, and then I was like, okay, this is so dramatic, so I'll make it like even more dramatic. Put some like eyeliner and put some testicle tears in there, which you wouldn't probably see as that when you see the drawing, but that's like the nice thing when you turn it into a painting, you can kind of, ah, there it is. Excuse the color scale in there. Um, so yeah, you can kind of see the, this thing, also the bubbles, it became like an underwater scene, kind of, like bones and hearts and nuts rushing down, but kind of like, like a row of things floating down. And I don't know, I don't know anything about gender, to be honest. The only thing I knew is like, okay, the one with the oven glove is probably the one that is not treated the best in this society. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, there, was, there was also like some, some grief situation in there. And this is when I realized, okay, I like, I like giving, giving attention to the small things, to the small beings and myself. <laughs> but also, I think there's representatives of, yeah, of something else. And, um, yeah. One of the other um, <laughs> misquotes I'll do of you, uh, just prompted by this kind of eyeliner on this particular painting <laughs> is, uh, and we'll both laugh at it, is I spend a lot of time embellishing myself. I'm quite a consumer of beauty products. And then a quote we couldn't particularly figure out if it was you or somebody else was uh, that you're using it to deconstruct gender roles in a playful way. That's um, old. Yeah, perhaps one of the one of the better descriptions I've, I've read of your work journalistically was as a bodily impossible. I thought that was a way more poetic way of expressing things. But we've touched on it in a number of ways. Maybe you, because there is such a pervasiveness of in this image, testicles and others quite phallic images. It's symbolism that you have, have referred to time and time again. Mm. Maybe, you know, and I think it probably is imagery that's provocative or evocative to most viewers. Um, how does this kind of consideration of kind of a gendered body mm. come into the work, you know, as you're, as you're creating it? They must, even if coming out of an automatic drawing mm. or painting, they must sort of appear to you as possessing one or two or many genders, how do you, do you then seek to destabilize that as the painting comes to fruition? I think that these things are really integrated and that's also the motivation of it. Like, I don't see them necessarily as sexual, um, more, more often as asexual, but I, it's not on me to, to say that, but I think the way I depict them is like, I integrate them because, you know, there's like a, maybe a boob floating next to a peanut, next to a heart that's breaking. And that's just like a way of saying these things exist and we have them, we don't have them. They look different. We don't know. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's, it's just like in a way saying that they're just hanging out there. They don't want to be certain things. They don't have to be certain things. And they don't, you know, it's like, I think that, that like in painting or whatever, not just in painting in life, like these things are so charged. And I want to, you know, uncharge them and be like, hey, you're okay. You can just be here and not do anything. You can just float in the water with the big fucking glove that's cl that's crying, you know. And we blow it up, and then it's like, I don't know. These things just like touch me on a deeper level, you know. <laughs> it uh, reminds me, and I'm gonna. This will be my last quote uh, quote of you um, of a piece of writing that you created to um, a company. I think it was your show last year with Pippi Holdsworth in London, and you wrote, and I think it was to really to describe. Um, the evocativeness of the forms, the 
um, sublimeness of the colors, you wrote, sometimes my nervous system gets confused, like old patterns trying to pull back into the binaries. Distract your senses to get out of triggers, they say, like cold showers or biting a citrus fruit. Parentheses, sour face, end parentheses. <laughs> now that, aside from being, you know, a striking poetic turn of phrase, um, I think in, it has been interpreted as likening the experience of your painting to a kind of um, psychic shock, but also a kind of healing. Um, and I think you have actually suggested that that's a, a valid reading of your work. Mm. Would you mind elaborating? And perhaps even because you brought it up in ref as I was speaking in reference to this painting, uh, maybe kind of map or unmap some of those ideas onto this particular image. Um, so when I did the glove painting that we just looked at, I had a talk with um, Oliver von Gustav, who's a German writer. Um, he did a very nice feature on me in German. Um, but in there's a quote or like something that he asked me. Um, I think, yeah, he just like, he made a joke. He was like, um, saying something like, oh, you're probably traumatized. I'm like, yeah, I'm traumatized. <laughs> and he was like, oh. And then he asked me for references in painting. I was like, I don't have any references in painting. <laughs> Anyways, but I was thinking, and I, I, I said, I have a trauma, but like, you know, in this world, no one wants to be, no one wants to be healed by painting. And I think that's quite a patriarchal way of thinking. And what I've been taught in school is like, painting is not allowed to be therapy in art, in the intellectual world. And I found it, like, I just said it, like, I said, like, because no one wants to be, you know, no guy in this world wants to be, <laughs> what is it? Healed, probably. Okay. So it's like, this is actually quite, quite good. <laughs> and I realized actually that, um, cause I, I thought, I started doing, doing drama therapy like three years ago or something. And it's quite buddy based. It's not very much of Freud in there. I play with Freud for sure, but like, it's not what I do. I think I, I believe, you know, in nervous systems and like how we can influence them and with our senses. And there's actually things with, when you have PTSD, um, and you get triggered and you get into fight or flight moment. There are things like taking a cold shower, biting a lemon and so on. And, there's a, like a way of distraction to not fall into the hole of fear, basically. And I think that my like initial way of getting into painting was actually also that a fascination, but also, you know, finding when you're insecure and you cannot leave, like you can step out of your body, you can run away, but when you cannot leave, you, or you maybe start to draw, you start to sing, so this is what I did when I was a kid. Um, yeah. And somehow that became something that I was thinking about. And um, yeah, that was also something that I went through uh, during the pandemic a lot. And um, yeah, and then I made really heavily collaged images like this one. And it was called, um, what was it called? <laughs> I forget the titles of my show. They're so complicated. <laughs> and, um, right. Um, basically, it was a, um, ah, stories of the imaginary self portray as two lemons. And just like, and part of that is like thinking of yourself in parts. And not thinking of like, I'm the traumatized one. I'm the artist. I've always been the artist. I'm born an artist. You know, it's, it's not like that. It's much more complex. And I think this is like going into the work. And the more collaged it becomes, the more complex it becomes. But it's still the same kind of storytelling that's like hiding things. And you feel like there's something, you know, behind that. That is also truth, you know. So, um, and I think this will probably be the last question before I turn over to any from the audience, but, and you sort of led to it yourself, which was um, that particular, and I think addressing a, the show at Pippi's last year, 
um, each of the titles had subtitles, if I'm correct, like kind of a parenthetical, sort of like two titles. Could be, yeah. To I do that a lot, yeah. like sort of track on to oh, these yeah, the multiple delay, yeah. um, dimensionalities of a subject, for instance. My kind of simplistic question based on that observation is, at what point, because the titles, whether it's Frail Juice or um, Pen Plus S or whatnot, <laughs> are such a yeah. big framing device for the work, when do the titles occur to you and before or after? And to what extent do you see them as, I guess, describing, disorienting, complementing the experience you, you of the painting? You have a quote there, right? I don't think so. I yeah, think I'm out of quote. quotes. You, you wrote something. Oh, wait, no. oh, no, we did. We both liked this quote. I think it was about destabilizing the meaning of the painting, no? Uh, no. How does that sound? <laughs> um, they're like descriptive. What was it? I think, I think of the titles more <laughs> as, as, as like pieces of poetry. like Complicate as much as they inform. Yes. There we go. Yes. Exactly. Um, mostly I do the painting first. I do the drawing first. I do the painting. I think about a painting and I give them a title and it, it's like um, it's like a proposition or like some, some just like ideas that come up like poetry, like words that are uh, as in between as the paintings are but, you know, still describe, yeah, something that is going on and that has a larger meaning than that. But yeah, they're not, some of them, some of them are just called too memorial or, <laughs> but I have this, yeah, this one is called um, Studio Scenery Clash of Muses. That is the drawing to this painting. Um, it's called Junk's Self-Portrait as Bone Chewer. It's an incredible before and after transformation from drawing to painting. This one, I mean, they're all very striking, how you interpret the drawing, but this one in particular um, almost has this quality of night and day. Yeah. <laughs> you mean the drawing and the painting? Mm -hmm. Like, this is night and this is day? I leave it to you to interpret <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or to tell us. Oh. So my last, last question yeah. is what are you, for those of us who based upon this talk, et cetera, are going to now follow you around the world. What is the, what is it that you're currently working on kind of most fixated on in the studio and just concretely what projects are you working toward? Um, so after this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to Georgia Tbilisi. For, for a group show where we build a space in the space, <laughs> which is something that I do kind of in the paintings as well. So th there's a group show there. And um, I'm going to do my second solo show in Berlin with Kapitän Petzl in November, um, which is going to, yeah, there, there will be links to more like ESO terrorism. What, what's the word? Esotericism we, we, or yes, eroticism? Yes, both, but <laughs> mostly, first of all, so there's going to be links to, um, to tarot, um, because this is what I did a lot in, in the last months of, um, uh, not being able to have much of a social life in the pandemic. Um, and also, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a big part of my life and my friend's life, so. It's going to be a fool's journey. <laughs> Far from it. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, please join me in a round of applause for Stephanie Heinze. Thank you so much for sharing your world with us. And Thank you. So happy to have you in Miami, and I hope you'll come back soon. Um, I think if we have time for one or two questions, I don't know if we have any brave members in the audience, but... Happy to hand over my microphone, should we have any questions. Ah. So a uh, question I have is, um, 
in regards to your graduate piece, like the first piece that we were shown, um, I remember you, not necessarily during this talk, but you referenced it in a, um, in a, in a past show with Petzl Gallery, um, like a year ago or so, with Frail Juice, the Frail Juice showing. And I remember you said something to the effect of, um, you had this like willingness to fail in a spectacular way. <laughs> and I thought that was really interesting. And the question I wrote down, so I don't forget, was does that mindset um, persist with you to this day um, with any of your pieces, or has that mindset changed in, in any sort of fashion since then? I think, I think I'm still there, but I think the, um, what, what failure means changes. Because I do, like, I didn't feel very skilled, even though they, t they taught me a lot, but I feel like I'm a much more skilled painter now. <laughs> but I think, I think with failing is like, yeah, I mean, it sits in the mindset of a society, kind of, and it's like how, yeah, how can you change rules? Like, how can, how can you use the failure of the rules that don't work to make better ones? kind of and um, so that's why I think I'm still on, on the same kind of working or that's something that strikes me and like still fascinates me and that con contains humor and is also probably yeah a very social and compassionate way of thinking and um, a more like Amy Simmons said something really nice in a, in a talk like last year. She said something, how humor works can go like up or down. Like, and I liked that a lot, especially yeah, when, when you like, depending on where you see yourself. Um, yeah, does that make sense? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you Have so much. Have a great much. night. Thanks, Mel. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Stephanie.